My name is Amit, Amit Verma. I'm the chief executive of a Calgary startup called as Braintoy. We are an artificial intelligence technology company which made a platform for easy AI development. Uh, before this, uh, I've been in entrepreneurship all my life and started working in Alberta oil and gas, started a company called as Viram, and then founded Braintoy. Uh, before we start, how many people are data scientists in this crowd today? Quite a lot, I say about uh, 20%, uh, which means that you would have developed a model, you would have deployed a model, you would have worked in some data science before. That's really great to hear that. So, Chris did a fantastic job of talking about the problems in AI development. What do you think is the biggest problem with AI? Anyone? There you go, bad data. Uh, readable models? Repeatable models, perfect, yep. You make something, you wanna repeat it, it doesn't repeat, how do you proceed? Makes total sense, what else? The ethics implication of AI. Yep, the ethical implication of AI. And uh, there was a story out in the news that Amazon tried a machine learning model for recruiting and what they did is they biased their data against women because in their data sampling, there were less number of samples for women, more number of samples for men. So you don't want that to happen in AI, right? What else? Too much hype. Too much hype, yep, yep, yep. I keep on hearing about that, you know. AI can solve any problem in the world as long as you give it data. And you know, it's doing heart disease identification, it's going uh, to the space and so on and so forth. But really, what is AI? How simple that is. Do we use AI on a day-to-day -day activity? Yeah, of course we do. When we order an Uber, when we shop on Amazon, when we go to Google Maps, we use AI. And these are really simple examples of AI. I'll tell you my summary of what's one of the biggest problems in AI. It's tough. You need to be a statistician, a data scientist, an AI developer, a cloud developer, a model risk manager, all in one in order to do any AI. Now, <clears throat> large corporations can afford it, but not everyone can. We have heard a lot about AI, that it can do magic transformations to organizations, it can bring out the profitability, it can increase your revenue, it can enhance customer service, it can make your cost go down. And you know, this is the normal thing with AI. It's like everyone wants to do AI. But this, I kind of think, is the reality. Oh man, it's tough. You need to hire lots of people. You need to train them, coach them. You need to have cloud infrastructure. You need to learn how to do coding. Somebody's got to teach me Python. What is R? And these things are coming up day to day. Today it's uh, Jupyter Notebooks, tomorrow it's gonna be something else. There's Dockers, Kubernetes, just wait for a year. <clears throat> so AI is really, really tough. So the goal in my mind is to make it simple. Now imagine if everyone in this room can develop an AI model and deploy it to production. That would be the power. It's not just the 10%, but everyone in this room. So to do AI, one of the simplest things which I often tell people is, do you really know your data? If you know your data, then it's really simple to develop AI models. And we are gonna talk about that today. So before the end of this presentation, everyone should be able to develop an AI model on their own, okay? And we're gonna see that how. So welcome to the Brain Toy AI Kitchen. So think of it this way. This is a commercial kitchen. In this commercial kitchen, there's pots, pans, recipes, uh, there's tools, there's skillets, there's knives, there's a refrigerator, there's a dishwasher, and all these tools exist for you. All you have to do is bring in your data. Your data could be your raw material, potatoes, tomatoes, meat, onions, you know, things like that. You have to learn to cook that data into something meaningful. Then you have to taste it and see if your meal is really ready. 
You have to serve it in a container, and then you have to interact with your model. So this is the general data science development process. So without going too much into the theory of AI, because Chris has done a wonderful job at what is AI, what are the problems in AI, we are gonna directly jump into the AI development process. So what we're gonna to do today? So imagine the Calgary Public Library, and recently we've been through a lot of cold, and the Calgary Public Library consumes some electricity. We are gonna use some historical data of uh, building, uh, make a machine learning model, and then use, it mod use that model for the purpose of prediction. And we're gonna do it in a really, really simple way. So first part is start by preparing your data. Now, let's imagine if I have to cook butter chicken. There are some raw materials which I need to cook it. I know what are those raw materials. I go to the supermarket, I buy my chicken, I buy some cream, I buy some uh, masala, and then I put it all together, and I start to make my butter chicken. So I know what my raw material is. Now here in this case, what we are gonna do is log on to the BrainToy AI platform, and bring in some, some of the raw material required to develop a machine learning model. So first things first, when you enter the BrainToy platform, <clears throat> you can see different buttons out here. This is the data engine. Data engine is where you bring in the data. Then is the machine learning engine. This is where you build machine learning models. Then there is a governance aspect in which you have to govern the models. You have to validate if it's right or wrong to deploy. Subsequently is a deployment manager in which you deploy the model as a container. And lastly is a dashboard where you interact with the model. So remember that we have to start preparing our data. So we're gonna go to the data engine and ingest some data. So here we go, you've got an option to upload a CSV, you can connect to a Google bucket, you can connect to an S3 bucket, and you can download your data from there or you can directly connect, or you can get your data from MongoDB or other data sources. So here in this case, what we are gonna do is upload a CSV file and uh, this is called the historical data, and we upload it. And immediately, <clears throat> you can start seeing the raw statistics of your data. So you can see there's something called as an ID, date time, temperature. Most of the values are below zero degrees. It had been really cold in Calgary. And some of the temperatures are in the positive. You can see pressure, wind speed, electricity consumption. So the raw statistics of your data are kind of made available to you without you being a statistician. But then sometimes you have to analyze your features. So you have to say, what is my electricity consumption as compared to wind speed, pressure, and temperature? And you hit this button once again, the correlation between the data is automatically shown to you. So you as a data scientist is trying to understand, do I have the right raw material, do I have the right number of potatoes, tomatoes, onions, meat, and cream. And then sometimes you have to wrangle your data. So for example, ID is of no use to me, date time, var one, var two, I'm just gonna zap. And once I zap that, then I can go and I can save this particular data set, and I'll save it as a YYC library data. So what you've done now is you've taken some raw data You've converted it, you've chopped it, you've cleaned your onions, you've thrown out the potatoes which are not good, and from this data, you're gonna go ahead and make a data set. Now you can see this data right here. So temperature, pressure, wind speed, electricity consumption. The next step is you've got to go and cook your data. So before that, what we are gonna do is we are gonna take the data which you just compiled. You can see the raw data right here and then you're gonna define a data set. Now in the world of data science, all you have to do is select your data, whatever you compiled. You have to understand what are you trying to predict. Now in this case, we're trying to predict the electricity consumption of the Calgary Public Library. So we are gonna select that as the target variable. We are gonna select the other feature inputs as the source inputs, and then you're gonna go ahead and save this as 
वाई वाई सी डी एस वन से एंड देयर यू हैव डिफाइंड योर डेटा सेट क्लिक दिस बटन क्लिक दिस बटन एंड यू आर स्प्लिटिंग द डेटा सेट इन टू पार्ट्स वन इज द ट्रेनिंग सैम्पल विच यू आर गन यूज टू ट्रेन योर मशीन लर्निंग एलगोरिथम एंड वन इज योर टेस्ट सैम्पल विच यू आर यूज टू टेस्ट योर मशीन लर्निंग एलगोरिथम सो यू कैन नाउ सी दैट योर ट्रेनिंग सैम्पल्स एंड योर टेस्ट सैम्पल्स आर रेडी नेक्स्ट स्टेप इज योर एंटायर डेटा इंजीनियरिंग इज डन सो समथिंग विच टेक्स टू वीक्स थ्री वीक्स यू कैन डू इट इन लाइक मिनिट्स नेक्स्ट स्टेप इज मूव टू कुकिंग now every chef is unique right like how i cook is very different than how you cook i'm pretty sure that the way you cook noodles is very different than the way you cook butter chicken so every recipe is different now what we going to do is we are going to take our data set that we've created and we are going to build a model which you can actually deploy to production so the next step is go to the machine learning engine so in the machine learning engine we are solving a regression problem you know classification problems are like red white blue green regression problems are max min optimum any number we are going to add a base model and select our data select our data set and then we are going to be presented with all these algorithms that are available to you now let's say you select the random forest regressor select the regressor and create a new model version and automatically the model is made for you now this is suppose what you know what you're doing but a lot of times you don't know what you're doing what you want is automatic machine learning right what you got to do is just create a bunch of models see which model performs the best and then tweak that model further so what we going to do is we are going to hit this button and this is the autopilot so what it does is it goes and create several models it ranks all those model gangs them with each other and tell you tells you which is the model which has best understood the data now think of it as children in a kindergarten class this guy is good in science this guy is good in math she is good in english he is good in sports now each one of them is going to understand the data a little bit differently now what we want to do is we want to train all of them we want to test all of them and we're going to say raise your hand who scored the highest she says hey i scored 99% nice i'm going to use her for my prediction he says i only scored 60% ah you better rest <coughs> you see what i mean so here now all the models are created for you linear svr is the worst performing model you can see that the mean absolute error is 110.39 on electricity consumption of 200 if there is an error of 100 it's not too okay okay but the next one which is the highest performing model is you know pretty good it's got a low error and i can see it's the k neighbors regressor now what i'm going to do is i'm going to go back here and i'm going to select my regressor and maybe do some hyper parameter tuning to see if my model can perform better or not so instead of 10 neighbors i'm going to select 20 neighbors and create a new model version so what i'm really doing here is a very iterative process i'm trying to see which model performs the best Oh you can see here that the model version 9 has got a low error even lower than the previous model now let's go ahead and we're going to see the documentation now you know one thing which i've kind of seen in data science is ai developers hate documentation they just don't like documentation they like to do creative stuff they like to make models they like to deploy models documentation is at the bottom of their pile so documentation normally gets left out in all model development process here the documentation is done for you automatically you don't have to do anything right from the time you started transforming your data till the time you built your model everything is recorded for you automatically so here you can see the document contains your raw data set uh, you can see different features which were there in the raw data set you can see the distribution of your training set and your Uh, test set now remember that uh, you know for example if i train some of the people in this class using a different data and i test using a different data you're not going to achieve the right results you're going to be biased so what i have to do is i have to make sure that my training and my test set are similar so let's take a look at wind speed they kind of look similar pressure they kind of look similar 
temperature, they kind of look similar, so my data sampling must be right. And here is my feature importance. Temperature, pressure, and wind speed. Well, who could have known that wind speed is the highest factor in electricity consumption? So the model is kind of telling us that. And then finally, you can see the actual test results. So original versus predicted, and what is my model actually predicting? If you want, you can actually view the results. So what that does is it kind of gives you all the documentation of the model in a very, very transparent, white box manner automatically. Now let's assume that you're satisfied with this model and you wanna go ahead and you wanna publish it. Go ahead and publish it as a workflow. So here I'm gonna change the reviewer to myself and uh, I'm gonna publish to reviewer. Now an interesting thing that we have noticed is small and medium sized enterprises cannot afford to have many people doing data science. They have like one person. And that what person has to make a model deploy a model, test a model, basically do everything, right? So right now we have published this model to Amit. Let's go to governance. Now in governance, you've got a model which is a published model. So somebody else is gonna check my work. Now in this case, I'm gonna check my own work. But for example, if I had a boss or a colleague or a business head, I would definitely want them to check my work too, which is the role of a model risk manager. So here in this case, the same documentation is presented to the model risk manager. They can go and they can validate the same results, the same data, and then they can go and accept or reject a model. So here I'm gonna go and accept a model, confirm. And then finally, we have to deploy this model to production, uh, which is once again a two week effort. You gotta go to your IT team, cloud developers, they're gonna say, let's start from scratch. And within two weeks, I'll try to give you something. So here in this case, we've got our deployed model. You select your model, click, use this model, generate code, and hit the deploy button. And instantly, a Docker is made for you. So we've containerized the model. So pardon me for uh, not following the presentation. After we have checked that it tastes good, we are now serving it in a container. Now you can consume your model. Now, when you create a Docker, it's not that you know it's all click, click, click. If you're an expert, you can go and you can modify anything. So in this case, for example, let's just wait for this Docker to be completed and all the code behind is automatically written for you. So when you go and you see your code repository, all this code is automatically written for you. If you're an expert, you can go ahead and you can assemble models, you can do anything. But if you're not an expert, you can just go ahead and click, click, click your way through to model creation. So now you can see that the application is running and the model is deployed. So we are gonna go and we are gonna consume it, right? So for every model that's deployed, a utility dashboard is automatically created for the user. So we don't even bother, it's like every dashboard is there. So in this case, we are at the dashboard level, and you can see that the dashboard is automatically created. On the left-hand side are your feature inputs, which is temperature, pressure, and wind speed. And on the right-hand side, you're gonna see the model response. So right now, the API status is kind of null. You hit predict. So if this was the temperature, pressure, and wind speed, you would consume 206.1 kilowatt hour of electricity. Now let's say that you change it to whatever, zero you once again hit predict and you get the new model response. So within the last 10 or 15 minutes, what we have done here is we have taken some raw data, uh, we have cleansed the raw data, we have made a data set, we split the data set into two parts, the training set and the validation set. Subsequently, we made a machine learning model, we tested all those models, we ranked all those models, we took the model which is the highest performing model, we then subsequently deployed it to production, and now we are gonna score some data. So once again, see how simple this is. What you do is go here, upload your new data file, which is for scoring, and then once you upload the file, you can see here that you've got some ID, date, time, temperature, pressure, wind speed, but no electricity consumption. So what we are gonna do is validate the data and hit in a few clicks. Uh, this is what we have to offer for 
enterprises which want AI in a very, very simple way. Now we are gonna wait for this to happen, but uh, let's go ahead and we are gonna complete the rest of the presentations. <clears throat> One of the biggest problems in artificial intelligence development is it's tough. Not everyone can afford it. Not everyone can do it. Not everyone can hire different kinds of people for AI development. By making the tools of AI really, really simple, what we are hoping to do is to give the power of AI to every organization. Why should a baker who has to bake uh, bread for tomorrow be deprived of AI? Why should the Calgary taxi service not compete with Uber uh, and lose out in the process? If those skills were given to the taxi Calgary service, they should be able to compete with Uber. They should be able to thrive. And that's really the purpose behind why Braintoy exists. Small and medium-sized businesses can compete with the big boys. They can kick ass, right? So a few advantages that you can see here is ease of embracing emerging technology. Uh, uh, Chris made a really good point uh, about the value of an AI platform, and it's immense. You can do coding AI is what I call it, you can do anything, but the platform brings it to a level where the ease of emerging technologies is very, very simple. So today, you don't have to be biased in using one application over another. You can pretty much use any application which has an AI, uh, which has an API. Your artificial intelligence, your intelligence platform is separate. Every API endpoint can be tied up with those applications. One day it's Python, second day it's R, third day it could be something else, but a platform kind of standardizes a lot of those things. Simple to use, and I think this is the biggest advantage. If all the people in this room can go and click, click, click their way through and complete AI development, I think that's power. Not 10%, but 100%. I believe that AI should be as simple as Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint, Word, Gmail, Google Maps. Everyone should be able to use it. Uh, and that is the power of uh, some of these platforms which are making AI super simple. Centralized and standardized. <clears throat> I can't talk enough about it. Chris has already made that point. Model version control, model scoring, model decay, retraining a model, redeploying a new version. All these things are really, really important. And without a standardized and a centralized AI platform, it's very difficult to run AI in any organization. Reduced errors and redundancies. You know, how many times have I thought, well, if I hire this guy as a data scientist, and if he leaves, I'm screwed, literally. He takes his code away with him, he takes his knowledge away with him, he takes his custom things away with him. How will an organization survive? by making sure that you know, your errors and redundancies are reduced by using an AI platform, you have that capability. And then lastly is safe and ethical AI. How do you sample your data? How do you deploy a model? How do you do version control? All this is kind of simplified in this platform. This gives SMBs a competitive advantage. So thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I believe that AI should be for everyone and the world is only starting where we are trying to explore these simple tools where anyone can use their data, use it as easy as cooking, deploy it as a container, and enjoy your cooked meal in like 10 minutes. Thank you.